chapter 1, we talked about how to consider it a joy to go through trials, to go through tribulations in our lives. This morning, we're going to be in the, the book of Philippians, chapter 1. I believe many of us are going through things in our life right now. We're going through things in our lives right now that we don't understand. And it's not for us to understand. In the things that maybe God is allowing us to go through in our lives today, a perfect example of our response should be Paul. This morning, my message is on how we should pursue joy through Christ. It's kind of a piggyback from the, book of, from the book of James chapter 1 that we were on last week. But this morning, I'm going to show you how Paul sought joy in Christ through his difficult circumstances, through what he was facing in his life. He did some amazing things. He did some awesome things that, that can't be understood. But you see, what happened was, was Paul was willing to allow Christ to work through him. Paul was willing to allow the trials, the tribulations that he was going through in his life, he was using them for God's glory. And in light of the circumstances that he was encountering, in light of being in prison, in light of all those things, Paul had joy. That same joy is available to us today. That same joy is available, but it's only available through Jesus Christ. It's not available through the circumstances. A lot of people look to our circumstances to find happiness. They look to circumstances for joy. Last, yesterday, if you're a college football fan, you sought happiness through your football team winning. Oh, I heard one, yeah. But I got a feeling there's a lot more of us yesterday that were pursuing happiness in other ways beyond Christ. We were looking for the circumstances around us to make us happy. Yes, I was a very happy person last night at 11 o'clock in my home when Tennessee punt the ball and it hit the leg of the South Carolina tailback down there. We recovered, and we won the game as a result. But yesterday, that was happiness. Joy in Christ is so much more than the world's happiness. Joy in Christ is so much more than a football game. Because how long is that happiness going to last to me that we won a football game? I'm over it. I'm happy this morning that we won the football game, but I've moved on beyond it. I've had other circumstances come into my life this morning that maybe desire to bring me down. Maybe that's, way of, that's Satan's way of saying, hey, I don't want you up there on that pulpit. I don't want you, uh, I don't want you having that joy in Christ. But this morning, I'm not going to let Satan get his way in my life. And I pray that you're here this morning and you're not going to allow Satan to get his way in yours. We seek to find happiness in the wrong places. As children of God, many of us seek happiness through the circumstances surrounding us. A lot of people that are addicted to alcohol and drugs, they look to alcohol, they look to drugs for that, for that, for that sense of being happy. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, can you put those verses up? Jesus explained how we can find lasting happiness. Jesus himself spoke these words in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of good news, you will save it. You know what Jesus was saying in those two verses? He was saying you have to remove yourself. You have to stop 
finding happiness in what's around you. And the only way, the only way to find lasting happiness is by losing yourself. Losing yourself, pursuing Christ, pursuing his gospel. That's the only way that you are going to have joy in life. Your circumstances change. Your circumstances can change in a moment. Your circumstances can change in a day. Your circumstances can change in a week. But joy in Christ is eternal. Joy in Christ is forever. (laughs) If you're willing to give up yourself and your own selfish desires and your own selfish wants and instead pursue what God desires and what God wants, you will find lasting joy. You will find a peace that goes beyond what the world can understand. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. You see, Jesus was preaching in this, in this, this was part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And he was mentioning, he was discussing the reasons that we, the reasons we as his children should not worry. He was comparing the pagans who eagerly seek after the material possessions in life for comfort and with believers who seek his kingdom and his righteousness. This morning, are you pursuing a life of comfort? Or are you pursuing your joy in Christ through his kingdom and through Christ's righteousness? Joy is only going to be found in the righteousness of Christ. And there's only one way that that righteousness of Christ can be made available. And that was through the death and the resurrection, the only blood of Jesus Christ. So this morning, I'm going to give you seven reasons Not to worry, to kind of piggyback on Matthew chapter 6. Can you put up verses um, 25 through 33 of Matthew chapter 6? If everybody that's able to, if you could please stand in reverence to God's word. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. You may be seated. In these verses, I want to point out seven reasons Christ told us not to worry. Number one, the same God who created life in you can be trusted with the details of your life. The same God that put breath into man, the same God that created man out of dust from the ground, He can provide your needs. He can provide your every need in everyday life. God will provide our needs. Worry does the following to us. Number one, worry is counterproductive to our health. It actually impacts our ability to function every day. How many of us worry? Anybody else? I'll I'll gladly raise my hand. I am a worry wart. And this is something that God has been working on in my life for a long time, is removing that worry. But that is one area of my life where I consistently fall short. I'm being bold with you. 
part of the reason that some of the health problems that I have today are a result of worry. When I get down in the dirt, when I start worrying about my circumstances, when I start worrying about the needs that I have, it becomes counterproductive to my health. And as a result, I can't function. There's truth in that counter. There's truth in the fact that worry is counterproductive to our health. It impacts our relationships with others because we treat people different when we have that attitude of worry. Have you ever noticed that? When you have that attitude of worry, it just, it just fosters this, this, this presence in your mind and you, you can't leave that worry behind, and as a result, it functions all aspects of your life that day. It, it affects the relationships with your spouse. It affects the relationships with your children. It affects all kinds of relationships. That's what worry does. So not only is it counterproductive to our health, and not only does it impact our relationships with others, but it also, number three, reduces the amount of trust that we have in God. When you worry, you are reducing the amount of faith that you have in God. Because when you're worrying, you are relying on yourself. Worry puts our life at a standstill. A lot of people have, have, have came up to me in the past and they said, well, there's, there's a difference between worry and there's a difference in concern. There is a difference in worry and there is a difference in being concerned. The, the difference is, with concern, it's calling you to action. With worry, you sit back, immobilized. That's the difference between worry and concern. So, seven reasons not to worry. Number one, the same God who created life in you can be trusted with the details of your life. Point number two, worrying about the future hampers your efforts for today. Why worry about tomorrow when, tom when today we have our own problems? You see, when we turn our attention to tomorrow, that has an impact on what God can accomplish in our lives today. So this morning, I'm focused on where God has me at this moment in time because I can't focus on what lies ahead tomorrow. God desires to use me today. So let's start allowing God to use us. Let's put aside those worries. Let's put aside those things that hamper our ability to function, that hamper our faith in God, and ultimately prohibits God from what He wants to do in our lives today. Is the worry that you have in your life this morning, is it prohibiting God from what He desires to do in your life at this moment in time? Now's the time to get rid of that worry. Now is the time to start pursuing a worry-free life with Christ. Point number three, worrying is more harmful than helpful. We've already made that point, and that can be seen in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. Point number four, God does not ignore those who depend on Him. That can be seen in Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 through 30. God will provide every need. If you go to God and you are asking Him for something specific, He will answer that prayer. He does not ignore us. When we bow our heads and when we pray, that is a telephone conversation that we are having with God, and that is our way of communicating our needs. That is our way of communicating our burdens to God. When you speak to Him, He is a listener. And not only does He listen, but He takes action. Number five, worrying shows a lack of faith in and understanding of God. Our Heavenly Father knows all our needs. Why don't we let Him worry about providing those needs? If He knows, if he knows all of the needs that we have in our lives, why are we trying to provide those needs ourselves? Why are we trying to find the answers? Why are we pursuing the answers? We should be pursuing the answers, but we shouldn't be pursuing the answers ourselves. We should be pursuing our answers by pursuing God. Point number six, worrying keeps us from real challenges God wants us to pursue. Worrying keeps us 
from pursuing real challenges that God desires for us to pursue. Instead of worrying about a situation, seek God and actually take action. David didn't worry about Goliath, did he? He saw an obstacle in his path, and what did he do? He put his faith in God because he knew God was going to get him through the situation. He took action. We as God's children, instead of worrying about our trials, instead of worrying about our tribulations, turn them over to God and let God take action. Stop being the obstacle. God's plan is not for you to be immobilized. God's plan is for you to be awakened. God's plan is for you to have your feet on the ground so you can help God go out and to make disciples of all nations. Worry takes that away. Worry keeps us from real challenges God wants us to pursue. Point number seven. Living one day at a time keeps us from being consumed with worry. That can be seen in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. If you try to live more than one day at a time, Satan's going to get to you. Satan's going to use that worry to destroy you. Satan's going to use that worry to immobilize you so you can't be used the way that God desires you to be used. But ultimately, that decision is yours because you have the authority through Christ to get past that worry. You have the authority through Christ to go out and help make disciples of all nations. You have the authority through Christ to seek His joy. Are you seeking his joy this morning or is worry immobilizing you? Now I'm going to go into my scriptural context for today, which is Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. I want to ask you all to stand again. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. We find Paul here in a situation in which the world would say he had every right to be unhappy. He had every right to be discouraged. He had every right to be worried. However, Paul proved Jesus' word in the context of his life. Paul used his situation. Paul used the fact that he was prisoned to a chain he was prisoned via a chain to a guard 24 hours a day. But in that, those 24 hours a day, what did Paul do? The guards changed out every four hours. And as a result, God proclaimed the good news through Paul to those soldiers that, were, that, were, that he was chained to. He considered it a joy to be going through what he was at that moment in his life. I'm here to tell you this morning, you may feel as though the chains, uh, the chains are tied around your ankles or they might be tied around your, your hands. But our God's a chain breaker and he desires to break those chains. And the only way that God can break those chains is by you transforming your mind, conforming your mind to his ways and to the good news. You know, when you look at Paul, he was God's chief apostle to the Gentiles. He was well-educated. He was influential. He had, helped exper uh, he, had, 
helped found churches all over the Roman Empire in his time. He, God divinely inspired and used Paul to write much of the New Testament. He was in prison in Rome for preaching the good news and awaiting a trial in which he could be executed. He was chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. He had already spent two years being confined in Caesarea without any crime on his part, and he had suffered a shipwreck and near death on his trip to Rome. In light of all these circumstances, Paul was abounding in joy. Jesus' instructions and his words were not only for the Apostle Paul. They were for us. <laughs> they were for us. They were shared by Jesus for all of us. Our objectives should be the same as Paul. What Paul did is he removed himself from the situation. He removed what he wanted. He removed his desires. And he pursued what God desires. Are you pursuing what God desires to do in your life this morning? In light of what you may be facing as an individual, in light of what you may be facing as a family, not knowing if the lights are going to be on in the house tomorrow, not knowing if there's going to be water coming through the faucet, not once in God's Word has He ever left a person hanging. Every example in God's Word, He provided the needs. Even when the children of Israel were disobedient and didn't follow His instructions, He provided them manna for 40 years in the wilderness, didn't He? If He can provide manna for His children for 40 years in the wilderness, do you not think He can provide you what you need to get through your trial and what you need to get through your situation today? There is joy in Christ. So how do we apply Jesus' words to our lives as Paul did? If you're not, take notes. Number one, say no to the self-life. Say no to the self-life. Remove what you want, remove what you desire, and instead pursue the desires of Christ and the gospel. We've already read Mark 8, verses 34 and 35. Another Scripture that I wanted to reference, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Say no to the self-life. Romans 8, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will, lie, you will live. So what is the Christian life? Number one, it is not a life lived for self, for personal, for, for personal fulfillment for doing what we think will bring us pleasure and happiness. That's not a Christian life. It's nothing about us. It's not about what we desire. God wants us to be happy. God wants us to live a good life. God has great plans for us, but we're the ones that mess those plans up. God wants us to have that joy in Christ, but in order to have that joy in Christ, you have to remove yourself. So it's not a life lived for self, for personal fulfillment, or for doing what we think will bring us pleasure and happiness. Number two, it is a life of daily and constant submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. By through power of the Holy Spirit, we say no to selfish desires and yes to the will of God. That means every morning when we wake up, we have to be willing to die to ourselves. We have to be willing to pick up the cross, and we have to be willing to take it forward and move forward instead of moving backwards. Are you picking up your cross this morning? Are you picking up your cross every day? Daily and constant submission. I don't know about you, but when that says daily and constant submission, 
To me, it's, it, it, it's multiple times a day that I have to daily submit. It, it, it's, it's, it's multiple times throughout the day that I have to confess because I mess up. I say things to people that I didn't mean to say. I hurt people that I didn't mean to hurt. I do things that are sinful in nature that I didn't mean to do. And sometimes I do them meaning to do them. So that gets me on my knees because when that happens, I have that conviction of the Holy Spirit that comes into my body and says, Dennis, you, you, you didn't do right there. You need to make right there. So it's a daily, it's a, in a constant submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Number three, in the Christian life, we must learn to submit every thought, every desire, every decision, every attitude, every action, and every relationship, and ask the question, does this please God? As you go through life every day, as you're making decisions in regards to your attitude, in regards to your relationships, are you asking that question? Does this please God? If it doesn't please God, it's not God's plan. It's not God's desire. His selfishness. Paul had a total disregard for his own selfish wants. He had a complete disregard for his own, his own desires. Paul's focus was on Christ. Paul's focus was on, gospel, on the gospel and proclaiming the good news of Christ. His focus wasn't on what is happening to me. Is that what you're thinking this morning? What is happening to me? Well, God wants to take that what is happening to me. And he wants to turn that around. Say, look what I can do in your life if you just let me do it. Paul does not speak one word or once complain. In regards to his situation. How often do we as his children. Complain about our situation. How often do we complain. About the trials and the tribulations. That we are going through in life. Does complaining help? There's a difference between complaining. And voicing. Your worry. Voicing your concern. Voicing your burdens. Complaining is just. Running your mouth. Concern is saying, this is going on in my life and I want it to change. And I want to take action to get it to change. The world's approach to Paul's situation, this is what the world would say. Number one, the world would tell Paul to get in touch with his feelings. The world would tell Paul, how do you feel about the way God is treating you? The world would say, how do you feel about the way that Christian leaders are criticizing you, Paul? The world would say, don't you feel hurt? Don't you feel wounded? The world would say, don't you want to lash out at them? That's how the world would take the situation that Paul was in. Christ would take that situation and he would work it completely different. How is God treating you? If he's giving you every need that you have to live every day, don't you think he treats us well? Here in the United States of America, we have the ability to have electricity in our homes. We have the ability to have water in our homes. We have the ability to drive in vehicles and go to our jobs. How bad can it be? We have it much better than other places throughout the world. And we should look at our trials and we should look at the tribulations that we're facing in our lives today and say, thank you, Jesus. We shouldn't have the self-pity party. But the world wants that self-pity party. The world wants us to feel sorry for ourselves because when we feel sorry for ourselves, do you think that's relying on God? Absolutely not. If you're having a pity party for yourself, that's allowing the self to come in. That's allowing the self to define you. The critics that Paul was speaking of here 
are believed to have been Christian pastors in Rome that were preaching the correct doctrine, but their hearts were in the wrong place. Their hearts were in the wrong place. These critics, they were jealous of Paul, and they were selfishly promoting their own desires, their own wants. Do you all realize that in the church today, most criticism comes from fellow believers and brothers and sisters in Christ than it does from outside the walls of the church? We should take a lesson from that. We should take a lesson from that. We should want to change that as his children. We should want to have a life filled with Christ. We, want to, we should have a life full of the attributes of Christ. When we're stabbing each other in the back, do you think as though that's living as Christ called us to live? No, that's allowing the world to define you. That's allowing the world. that When you do that, you are serving the world. You are not serving Christ. Are you letting, are you serving the world or are you serving Christ this morning? Well, if you're serving the world, you're not going to see the happiness. You're not going to see the joy that we're talking about. You're not going to see the joy that Paul experienced. But if you're pursuing Christ and you're pursuing the gospel, you can experience that joy that Paul was experiencing here in Philippians chapter 1. Discipleship is the only option for those who believe in Christ Jesus. The only path for a true Christian is that of learning daily to say no to selfish desires and yes to the Lordship of Jesus. So, again, the two steps. How do we apply Jesus' words to our lives as Paul did? Number one Say no to the self life. Remove your want, your, remove your wants and desires, and instead pursue the desires of Christ and the gospel. Number two, say yes to the gospel as first in your life. Say yes to the gospel as first in your life. First Corinthians chapter nine verse twenty three. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Do everything to share the good news and the blessings of Christ. First of all, we have to seek the kingdom of God. If first of all we seek the kingdom of God, God will meet our needs. If first we seek our own needs, we're going to fail. Because this world is too much for us to handle. Our trials the things that we are going through in our lives, they're too, much for him. they're too much for us to handle. They're too much for us to work out. When we try to work things out on our own, what happens? We fail. When the church tries to work out the problems within the church, the church will fail. But when the church allows Christ to come in and change the church, when the church allows Christ to come in and do what He desires. The church will experience that spirit of being united. Don't you all want to get back into that united spirit as an overall church throughout this world? Can you imagine what the world could do today if the church was united? Man, I'm excited about the day. I hope it happens while I'm here upon this earth, but when that church unites together throughout this world and has a revival. Can you imagine how sweet that would be? We should be excited to serve God. We should be excited to go through the trials and the things that we go through in our lives because those trials only make us more like Christ. Those trials only make us rely more on Christ. We as His children, we should be relying more on Christ. We as the church should be relying more on Christ. Saying yes to the gospel is first requires that you understand and believe the gospel. I'll say that again. Saying yes to the gospel as first 
requires that you understand and believe the gospel. Sin has alienated everybody from a holy God. When Adam and Eve sinned, that sin alienated everybody. But God made a way to get rid of that sin. If you don't get rid of that sin, and if you die in that sinful condition, God's Word tells us that you will spend eternity in hell. However, the good news, and this should be our focus every day, the good news of the gospel is that God sent His Son Jesus to die for us on that cross. God sent His Son Jesus to shed His blood upon that cross and to be resurrected from the dead so that we wouldn't have to die in that sinful condition. The blood of Jesus covers those sins. And that is the only way, that is the only way that we can get rid of that sin in our lives. You hear false teachers today preach that good works can get you into heaven. You hear false prophets say that good works can get you that eternal life. But God's Word tells me that's false. God's Word tells me the only way to get to heaven, the only way that we can pursue eternal life is through the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to confess the fact that you are a sinner. You have to confess your sins. You have to ask Him to come into your life. You have to make Him your Lord and Savior. Are you doing that this morning in your life? Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? Or are you looking to material circumstances as your Lord and Savior? Those material things that the world provides you, those will last for just a minute. They'll be gone tomorrow. They might not be gone tomorrow, but I can assure you they will wear out. If you want a beautiful car and you want to spend $100,000 on it, you can go buy it if you have that $100,000 and you can ride around in that car all you want. But one day, that car is going to die. You can have the job that gives you $500,000 a year. But that $500,000 a year isn't going to last forever. It's going to run out. Are you serving the material things in your life? Or are you serving God? Jesus doesn't run out. Jesus doesn't run out. Romans 5, verse 8, tells us, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When you feel uncertain about God's love for you, Remember that He loved you even before you turned to Him. Even before you were created, when, even before you were in His womb, God was loving you. God knew how many hairs were going to be on your head. God knew that I was going to be bald today. That's okay. He doesn't look at my head. He doesn't look at my life. What God looks at in me is He looks at my heart. And He looks at my heart. And due to the fact that I've confessed my sin, and I do it on a daily basis because I still mess up every day. But due to the fact that I've made Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and due to the fact that every day I'm trying to pursue God instead of pursuing what Dennis wants in life, every day, every day I can feel the Holy Spirit in me. Do you feel the Holy Spirit working in you this morning? Do you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you? Maybe, maybe you're serving yourself instead of serving Christ. If you feel that conviction this morning, maybe you're serving the wrong person. Maybe you're focused on the wrong things. John, verse, John chapter 1, verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. To believe the gospel means to commit your life both now and for eternity to Him. 
It's not saying I'm going to commit my life to him today and run away tomorrow. To believe the gospel, to practice the gospel, to serve Christ means to give up yourself every day and to pursue God anew every single day. Stop putting our faith in the material things. Stop putting your faith in other things other than Christ himself. A lot of people might say that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But have you ever experienced Him? Have you ever practiced that faith? If you get on the airplane and you fly from Knoxville to Miami, you have faith that that airplane is going to get you to Miami. But you don't practice your faith until you get on the airplane. You can believe all day that an airplane will get you from Knoxville to Miami, but you're not relying on that airplane until you get on it. And that airplane goes up in the sky. And then you're practicing that faith. A lot of Christians believe in faith. But are you practicing it? Are you practicing that faith? What you're facing in your life this morning, are you practicing faith in Christ? In believing the gospel, we cannot truly believe the gospel unless we are practicing our reliance upon the gospel and living under it by fully committing ourselves through faith. Through faith in Jesus, we got to relinquish ourselves and we must fully commit our lives to the Lord every minute of every day. Colossians 1, verses 13, and I'm just going to read 10 through 14. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. Always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and, or verses 10 through 14, we see five benefits that God has provided to all believers through Christ. Number one, he has enabled us to share in his inheritance. He has enabled us to share in eternal life through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, he has rescued us from Satan's kingdom of darkness and made us his children. He has rescued us from Satan's kingdom of darkness and made us his children. Number three, he has brought us into his eternal kingdom. Number four, he has purchased our freedom from sin and judgment with his blood. And number five, he has forgiven our sins. Saying yes to the gospel at, at first requires proclaiming the gospel through your walk and through your words in every situation. Do your words, do your actions, does your walk reflect Christ this morning? Paul thought of the Roman soldiers that he was chained to as his captives. Instead of him being a captive, he thought as the Roman soldiers as his captive. Paul's attitude was different from the normal prisoners in which the Roman soldiers were accustomed to guarding. He never complained. What was Paul doing while he was prison in prison? He was singing. He was praying. He was praising God. Should we look at our situation today 
that we might be facing, maybe we should be praising God. Maybe we should be praising God for working out His plan instead of working out ours. Paul took an interest in the Roman guards as individual persons. He asked about their families. He asked about their backgrounds. He asked about various issues of the days. And he even prayed for them and their needs. That's what God calls us to do as his children. He calls us to share our burdens with each other. He wants us loving each other. He doesn't want us to complain about things. He wants us lifting each other up. And he, he wants us to share our burdens with each other so we can all be praying about our burdens together. Our walk always has an effect. Not only on the lost, but also on God's people. Where are you at in your walk today? Are you serving Christ? Are you pursuing that joy that can only be made available in Christ? Or are you serving yourself? Do you refuse to remove yourself? This morning, I challenge you to remove yourself. This morning, I challenge you to start pursuing Christ. Because when you are pursuing Christ, when you are serving Christ instead of serving yourself, God is much more capable of doing what He desires to do. It's time that we start allowing God to do what He desires to do. And it's time that we remove ourselves from what we want to do. Instead, putting God first. The way to a successful marriage is to put God first. The way to successful finances is to ask God where your money goes. The way to battle depression is to allow God to do what He desires to do and let God fix your mind. It's time we start allowing God to do what He wants to do. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the words that You have spoken this morning. Father, I pray that we take what you have said this morning and I pray that we would find ways in our lives to remove ourselves and make you more available. I pray that I would myself would remove myself from my walk and become more reliant on you. Father, let us practice that faith that you desire for us to practice. Let us turn our burdens over to you this morning. Let us pursue you in all that we do. I thank you for being the amazing God that you are. I thank you for holding my hand through the trials and the tribulations that I face day in, day out. I pray that I would be more of an example for Christ this week in my walk, in my words, in my actions. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Garrett to come up and lead us in a... I'm going to ask Garrett to come up and give us our announcements. Thank you, sir. Good job. Hey, a couple quick things. Um, one, there's a youth leadership meeting right after. Where's that going to be? Better? Where you meet? In the conference room, in the modular, in the back. So anyone involved in youth leadership, uh, please uh, head that way. And also, next week is our monthly congregational meeting, too. So it'll be right after church. Usually there's a 15, 20-minute break, and then, uh, and then uh, the meeting will be right after that. So I just want to make a quick comment on, I really appreciate Dennis's message. 
on that. I really, the thing that kind of stuck with me a little bit is that kind of worry immobilizes, and yet concern will get us into action. And uh, I even think of that about complaining. When he mentioned complaining, complaining does the same thing. People will tend to come up and complain to you a lot of things, uh, but it doesn't get you into action. And I like to tell someone now when they come up and complain, maybe God's telling you to do something about that. If it's on your heart and you feel God's laying it on your heart, then it's probably God telling you, I want you to get involved and do something on this. Don't complain and expect someone else to do it. Do something about it. So anyhow, great, great message. Thank you for sharing that, Dennis. If we could, let's stand and let's uh, pray together, and then you'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for your reminder that we should not be worrying, but we should be just putting our faith in you, trusting you, Lord, in everything. And when, uh, when we get that worry in us, Lord, it's, you should remind us, Lord, that it's just the enemy trying to get into our heads. May we uh, put that worry aside and instead put you in the forefront. Help us to follow you and trust you in all things. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we lift this up in the name of Jesus. Amen.